Thank you, and I'm John Tyner, President of the Forum. The Washington County Public Affairs Forum is a public service of this entity, and we bring topical um, items of interest in the community, and um, we provide those on Mondays at noon at the Pepper Mill Restaurant. Um, I'm currently president, but that's going to change shortly. Rob Solomon, I believe, is going to be our incoming president. We're going to have a board of directors meeting here coming up in December. Um, and and uh, I first got on, first became associated with the forum when I was 27 years old, and I was on the board by 29, and um, and basically so I did three years on the board at that time, and this was my fourth year on the board. I think I'm going to go to past president, and so we encourage all the members of the forum who are concerned about the direction of the forum or want to have input to basically offer your assistance to Rob and myself. I think I'll be past president, and we're going to try to find a format that works for everybody in the forum. Um, we're, of course, um, this is a TV show, and we're shown on um, the uh, Twalton TVCC Channel 21. That's uh, Twalton Valley Community Television. Uh, and again, we're here, and our former president, Kathy Stanton, recently died. She was a Beaverton City Councilor, and so we're going to be doing some things um, for her. And if anyone on the television audience wants to participate, we've got a Facebook site, Washington County Public Affairs Forum, uh, facebook.com. So, but anyway, we've got future programs. The program today is Professor Jim Moore at Pacific University. On the 24th, we're going to have Hillsborough Empowers Youth. And on December 1st, uh, Mayor Pete Truax of Forest Grove is going to be here to talk about um, what's going on there. And we, um, we, we've confirmed on the 15th that Representative uh, Tobias Reed and John Davis will be making a presentation. So today, our, our guest is Professor Jim Moore who um, has actually received recently national exposure on a number of uh, issues. And uh, we, of course, sort of say when we remember him when, but um, as he emerges as, as not just a statewide authority, but an authority on national issues, he still comes to, to um, uh, Washington County Public Affairs Forum to, to lend his expertise to explaining what just happened in the election. Um, Professor Moore is um, obviously one of the most uh, respected commentators in Oregon and becoming so on the national level. And, I'm not just apple polishing because my son is one of his students. Of course, that does help. But um, his perspicacious um, uh, views are been entertained us for years. And I'd like to thank Professor Moore for sharing his time with us. And um, as always, once he's finished with his remarks, members of the Public Affairs Forum can come over there and ask a question after identifying themselves. So, Professor Moore, would you like to speak to us? Thank you. Gee, perspicacious is such a big word. Uh, I got to tell you, the national stuff happened because um, apparently it's really good when you have uh, <clears throat> statewide races that are, people are paying somewhat attention to. Um, but you have uh, Sylvia Hayes and you have Monica Webby. Then the national media starts coming. Uh, who knew that I would ever be on the tabloid TV show Inside Edition? Uh, so. <clears throat> Basically, want to go through the election. Um, many of you were living the election, so just kind of hit some highlights and then begin to look forward to what we're looking at at the national level and at the state level and some things here locally as well as we look towards 2015. Uh, <clears throat> nationally, this was an election that we expected the, de the Democrats to lose, uh, not because they were Democrats, but because their party's president is in office in a midterm election, especially in the second term. Uh, you can go back basically through the entire 21st and 20th century, and that president's party always loses during that election. Uh, you can even go back to just regular midterms for the first term, and you see the same kind of pattern. The only time it's been different, FDR's first midterm election in 1934, and then oddly enough, Bill Clinton's impeachment election in 1998. The Democrats actually picked up seats in the legislature uh, in, at the national level in that 1998 election. Not enough to take either the House or the Senate, but enough to uh, send a, a different message. Here in Oregon, uh, for our congressional races, uh, no big surprises. We were basically like the entire rest of the country. There are 435 members of the U.S. Congress, the U.S. House. There were 15 competitive races. So you can do the math. We're dealing around somewhere around 3% of all members of Congress actually had races that were competitive in some way. Uh, and the Republicans at this point have picked up 15 seats. 
Uh, so the Republicans had a good run in a very, very small portion that was moving. Uh, put this in a little bit of perspective while the national media is talking about, oh my gosh, the Republicans have taken over everything. 20 years ago was the Republican Revolution. We were in the middle of the Republican Revolution. This is when Elizabeth Furs defended her seat by 301 votes. This is when Jim Bunn beat Mike Kapetsky in the 5th Congressional District. This is when Linda Smith came in across the river in, in uh, Clark County in Washington State. Uh, at that point, the Republicans picked up 54 seats. So this is not a revolution that we've just seen. This is part of a normal back and forth. Uh, it's going to give Obama fits, uh, but yes, that's why we pay him the big bucks, to have those fits taken, and it's a very common pattern. Uh, for our congressional seats, you know, basically nothing happened. Um, we were looking to see if Art Robinson in try number three would take out uh, Peter DeFazio. Uh, you may recall Art Robinson's claim to fame this time was that he was now the chair of the Republican Party, but he also put a call out to have 500,000 people give him urine samples for his business so that he could begin to predict what uh, diseases were out there. This didn't go very well. He, he lost by the biggest amount he's ever lost to Peter DeFazio. Um, who knows if the urine samples had anything to do with it, but whatever it is, Art Robinson appears to have run his course in the 5th Congressional, or the 4th the Congressional District. Uh, and so, basically, congressionally, nothing happened. So we looked at the Senate. This was going to be the big race. Merkley comes in six years ago. He comes in almost through no fault of his own. He's against a strong incumbent, but in September of 2008, the economy went south. Voters, as they do every time when something like that happens, blame the incumbent president's party. The incumbent president, George W. Bush, Republican, Democrats swept in, and Jeff Merkley was one of them who swept in in that 2008 race. So his first defense, what has he done? How can he defend? Well, any first-term senator hasn't done much. That's basically by definition. His big stuff has all been kind of behind the curtain kinds of things. So uh, having an impact on who was appointed the new chair of the Fed, uh, having an impact on, on filibuster reform, nothing that fits on a bumper sticker, but very typical for a first, first year or first term uh, senator. And so the Republicans were looking around for a candidate. Uh, we talked last May about that candidate. Uh, it ended up being Monica Webby. Back in D.C., they were doing backflips over Monica Webby. They thought she was great. She's a physician. Healthcare is her big thing. People don't like Obamacare. Um, back here in Oregon, we were looking and saying, what does she do besides Obamacare? And who is she? And it turns out we in Oregon were kind of right about all of that. Uh, she ended up with a campaign that had one major problem just before the primary. Uh, when it came out that uh, you basically don't want to date Monica Webby, just saying. Uh, and so that, that comes out, and then that, that's something that, that happens. What was remarkable, though, was that her campaign was dead silent about it. It took about three, four, five days for a credible response to come out of the campaign. Uh, Jeff Mapes just uh, talked to the person who was running her campaign at that point, a guy named Charlie Pierce, and Charlie Pierce said, I had no idea in the world this was coming. Um, my response to Charlie Pierce is, you're a professional, they flew you in from D.C. to run this thing, you should darn well have had a response sooner than three to five days, period. But whatever it was, so that, that happened. So we were looking over the summer, can she put together a strong campaign? Importantly, she didn't raise that much money, only about $900,000 for the primary. Can she raise a lot of money? The yardstick? Four years ago, Chris Dudley almost became the governor of this state, and he raised $10 million. So we don't expect Monica Webby to have to raise $10 million, but boy, it'd be great to see six, seven, eight, nine million in there. And so over the summer, uh, she basically completely failed to raise money. And so it showed a campaign that wasn't going very far. Uh, we get into the fall, and the campaign season starts up. She basically is still an unknown in the state. And polling began to show that by the end of September, beginning of October, people were simply asked to name who our senator was. And, you know, a little over half could name Jeff Merkley, which isn't great, but, you know, it's kind of normal for a first-term senator. 
Uh, Monica Webby, just being able to, people being able to name her was kind of down in the 20s and 30 percent. She was basically an unknown, even among Republicans who paid attention to politics. That's not a good sign for a challenger. Uh, her campaign goes on. We get plagiarism accusations. She decides at the last minute not to show up for a debate that everybody thought she was going to show up for. Once again, these are not big things in and of themselves, but the same pattern happened with a new campaign team. Dead silence from the campaign for three to five days. And so the voters are beginning to understand who Monica Webby is. They don't really know her, but what they do know about her is, wait, isn't she the one who stuff happened to? Um, and so Monica Webby was digging herself a deeper and deeper hole, not being able to raise money. And so the, the net, net of all this is Jeff Merkley cruises to victory by 20 points. Uh, Jeff Merkley is one of the few in that class that came in six years ago that survived this time. When you look across the country, one reason Republicans were favored to take the Senate is because that economic hit that happened in 2008 brought in candidates in states who you would not otherwise have expected to win. At this point, we're coming out of the recession or the recession is too far away for people to really focus on as generating the way that they vote. And those candidates, when they were running for re-election, lost. And that's exactly what we saw. It's very funny to look at the national coverage and they talk about loss here, loss there, loss everywhere for Republic or for Democrats, excuse me, wins for all the Republicans. And they completely forget to mention Jeff Merkley out here who won by 20 points. So here's what Jeff Merkley needs to do, uh, quick and cut to the chase. He simply needs to keep breathing and gain seniority. <laughs> Number two, he's got to become the go-to person in the Senate for some issue that's important. Think about Ron Wyden. He developed this while he was in the House, but he was the go-to guy on old folks' issues. He was the go-to guy on a lot of health issues. In the Senate, he was on the Intelligence Committee, still is, so he becomes the go-to guy on intelligence. He builds up that expertise. If you want to pass something, you got to talk to him. Merkley's got to do the same thing. He's got to build it up. He's got expertise in uh, housing issues. He's got expertise in international relations, international trade. Whatever it is, he's got to start developing that so he becomes becomes a crucial player in the Senate. And six years from now, we'll see how that goes. So <clears throat> federal things happened here in Oregon. They went the other way. Um, kind of fun, kind of interesting. Then we had a gubernatorial race. And here we had uh, this fascinating dynamic. John Kitzhopper going for his fourth term. Uh, he eventually wins that fourth term. For those of you keeping track, Jerry Brown in California won his fourth term. Terry Branstad in Iowa won his fifth term. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of people who've been around a long time in the governor's office at this point, and these are four-year terms. These aren't two-year terms, which some states have. Uh, Kitzhaber against Dennis Richardson, a lot of the same issues for Richardson as for Webby. Can't raise money that well, not very well known in the state. What are his issues? You know, where, where does he come from? And, and he didn't do a very good job in the primary of explaining that. He comes out of the primary with very, very basically no credible opposition. Uh, and so we were looking for the summer. So introduce yourself to the state, raise money, do all those things. He had a cool plan. He's from Central Point. He was going to move up here to the Portland area and get to know, I don't know, inside the belly of the beast or something like that. <laughs> Uh, and so, wonderful. So we expect to see you at county fairs, we expect to see you in parades, we expect to see you at groups all over the place. And uh, as far as we can tell, all he did while he was up here is cut some commercials riding around on his motorcycle. Uh, he was basically a, a no-show in the area during the summer. He had a wonderful chance to do that, a good plan. It didn't come to fruition. Uh, so we get into the, the, the campaign itself as we start up in September. And Richardson, his, his main campaign is John Kitzhaber has run out of ideas and John Kitzhaber has ethical issues. And so when you listen to him in debates, when you listen to his commercials, when you listen to him in person, uh, the name that most often came up was oddly enough not John Kitzhaber, it was Patricia McKaig. And Mat Patricia McKaig is uh, supposed to be the Kitzhaber link to corruption or crossing ethical lines. Uh, pretty much inside baseball, Patricia McKaig's name does not resonate very much with that big a grouper out there. But that was his campaign. It didn't go anywhere. 
Um, he kept go going farther and farther and farther behind in all the opinion polls. Um, the big question about four weeks ago, actually about five weeks ago now, uh, just before Sylvia Hayes broke, was whether or not he, uh, Richardson would actually get more percentage than Bill Sizemore did in the greatest defeat ever for a gubernatorial candidate in Oregon history in 1998. And all of a sudden, from heaven and Willamette Week comes the <laughs> Sylvia Hayes issue, and uh, all of a sudden the campaign begins to turn around. Now, the Sylvia Hayes issue was fascinating, partly because it was pretty clear that people, as they were thinking about it, were saying, yeah, this raises issues, but the main issues for about the first three weeks of the, of the, uh, the Sylvia Hayes saga, the issues were the same things that got the tabloids to contact me. She had a sham marriage, and she wanted to grow pot. And uh, Oregonians, when pushed on that, basically said, we don't care about that. But the Richardson people were really good at pushing, no, it's not about that. It's about the ethics in the governor's office. It's what's happening in the governor's office about her connections to companies that had business before the state, uh, how decisions were made, where things were going. And that began to shift things. We never thought that Richardson was going to win, but from going 10, 15, 20 points on some polls down, he was certainly going to close the gap, and that he did. Uh, eventually, Kitzhaber wins. Kitzhaber wins uh, by five percentage points, um, much less than the 10 to 15 we were expecting him to win and the 20 that he was hoping that he would win by. Um, and so it looks like Kitzhaber is damaged politically because of all this. Uh, another way to look at it, however, four years ago, he won by 22,000 votes. Uh, this time, he won by about 80,000 votes. So he actually increased the number of votes by four times. Uh, but that's not, that's not going to be what's important politically. What's going to be important politically is he's just shy of getting 50% of all the votes that are out there. Uh, and he didn't win by as much as, as was expected. And so as we go into the next legislative session, it looks to me like this is a Kitzhaber who at this point is as hurt politically as he ever has been. He may even be in worse shape than he was at the height of Republican control of the legislature in the 1990s when Kitzhaber became Dr. No because of all the, the uh, vetoes that he uh, was putting out there. So that was kind of fun to watch, uh, but once again, it, it, it didn't surprise, and we didn't expect a Republican to come through, especially Dennis Richardson. Now, Dennis Richardson missed a huge opportunity, and the opportunity was Dennis Richardson. Dennis Richardson's claim to fame in the legislature, he was one of the people in charge of the Ways, Ways and Means Committee that balanced tough budgets, that reached across party lines to come up with solutions, and convinced people and the governor to go along with a whole bunch of things that make this state work. All of that was completely missing from his campaign. His campaign was, vote for me because I'm not John Kitzhaber. And that is not good enough. You've got to vote for people because you want that person in there somehow. Uh, so Dennis Richardson missed a tremendous opportunity. A lot of people have asked, boy, would, what if Chris Dudley had been in the race or Ron Saxon from eight years ago? And it certainly probably would have been different. Um, Kitzhaber is a really strong campaigner. I don't think that that means that a Dudley wins, uh, but it certainly would be a much different race if we had one of those Republicans who's a moderate who can appeal to those voters in the middle and appeal to those Democrats who are looking out there saying four terms, four terms is too many, and get those, pla those people a place to go to vote. Uh, but Richardson didn't provide any of that, and so Kitzhaber comes in. Uh, we had some fun ballot measures. Uh, the ballot measures, just to uh, you know, refresh our memory, we had a lot of pot. We uh, decided to eat lots of things that are apparently bad for us or good for us, depending on how you come out. Um, and then we decided uh, in a big way that uh, we don't want driver's cards for people who are here without proper documentation. In all of these elections, we learned important things about this state. So let's start with the big one. Let's start with GMOs. GMOs, uh, at this point, are losing by about 4,000 votes. There are about 13,000 contested ballots out there, usually where the signature isn't correct, and they've got to go check and see if the, the signature's okay. 
I think it's going to lose, and the reason is simple. If you look at 13,000 votes, and you're trying to gain 4,000 total, so you got to get 9,000 of those votes to be on your side, there's no reason at all to think that those 13,000 are divided any differently than the 50-50 split that we're seeing in the rest of the ballots that are out there. They'd have to break about 70-30 towards having GMO labeling if the GMO people are going to win, and I just don't think that's going to happen. But tomorrow's the day we've got to certify everything, and so we'll basically we'll find out as, as we look. But I don't think it's going to happen. So GMO, this is, uh, remember... Basically, at a statewide level, round three for the people who want GMO labeling and the huge corporations that don't want GMO labeling. Uh, fascinating campaign. We knew money would come in in a big way. What was surprising to me is the big money didn't start coming in until the 1st of October. Uh, before that, the anti-GMO people had like $600,000, and then all of a sudden Monsanto started dropping millions, and DuPont and everybody else in their... Their uh, well-heeled mother-in-law started dropping a lot of money. And so we end up with approximately, last I checked, about $23 million spent to defeat the GMO measure. The other side was not doing half bad. They end up with about 8 or $9 million to pass it. Uh, there's kind of sugar daddies on both sides, uh, um, companies that want the arguments in there. The most fun was uh, Ben and Jerry's ice cream apparently had their Ben and Jerry's ice cream truck driving around to all the rallies, and they were giving away free non-GMO ice cream uh, to people at rallies. Uh, so it became a national, a national issue. Uh, why does it fail? It fails because of the reason that most ballot measures in Oregon fail. If people have questions about the measure, you vote no because no keeps the status quo. It keeps things the way they are. So the fascinating part about this campaign was the yes people were saying, people need a choice. Uh, it's, you, it's kind of your right, they didn't stress what right that might be, but it's your right to know what's in your food. Okay, so that's good. It gets to us who, who, who want to make individual choices, care about food, et cetera, et cetera. The no campaign, though, was very interesting. It was not a campaign that said, it doesn't matter if your food is labeled or not. It was a campaign that said, you know, this isn't the right law to do it. It was a campaign that implied, it is OK to label GMO food, but this isn't the good way to go about it, because it misses some things, which is really, really interesting when you think about it. Uh, and they spent a lot of money. Um, Boy, do they spend a lot of money. Uh, by the time we got to uh, just two days ago, uh, people have been looking at it. Television stations in the state were paid $24 million for ads, and about $10 million of that comes just from the GMO fight. Uh, $7 million comes from the U.S. Senate race, um, which was, you know, that's great for local television. Uh, but it, it, it took a lot of money to, to sway voters and basically get that doubt into their mind. Uh, and so that's where we end up. We have a no on GMO. Is it coming back? Absolutely it's coming back. And the reason is, as we've talked about here before, in the midterm elections, there are fewer voters. And because of that, the proportion of voters that are Republican is a little bit higher than it is when there's an election in a, during a presidential year. And so the thinking goes at this point, no one's done the exit polling and things to make sure that this is what happened, but the thinking goes, Democrats will be more likely to vote for this than Republicans, and so we'll come back in two years when there's a higher proportion of Democrats who are out there voting. And with, with the 4,000 vote difference, that may be an entirely reasonable supposition at this point. So the other big one, marijuana. Once again, we are not leading the way. This is not the 1990s. This is not uh, assisted suicide and the Pope knows where we are. Uh, these are things that other states have done and we're getting on the bandwagon. So marijuana comes in. Marijuana was fascinating. In early September, I predicted it was going to lose. Why? Because of that issue of the initial favoring of a ballot measure and exit polls and then what happens to people as doubts are raised. The polling for this was 51 to 55 percent for, and a solid 44, 45 percent against. And that's just not a big enough lead 
for people, when they look at this measure, the history says we can chip them off. You can say, wow, you know, legalized marijuana might be a good thing or a bad thing, but whatever it is, you put doubts in people's minds and the number of people who support it will go down. In this race, going against, as far as I can tell, at least 50 years of Oregon political history, no one changed their minds. This thing won 55-45. And so Oregon goes on into the great legalized marijuana unknown. Uh, having looked at, Calif at Colorado and uh, look at Washington to see what's going on. Remember our legislature a little over a year ago actually put together a committee to try to figure out when this passes, what are we going to do? And so now we'll see what kind of work that committee has actually done. Uh, the revenue report that just came out last week was the first one that was legally now required to have a uh, prediction about what the income is going to be from pot. And so we've got those predictions. They're working them into the budget. Uh, for the first several years, pot's not going to do anything to the budget because it's just going to be a minuscule amount. But who knows what's going to happen as time goes on. Once again, people will be looking carefully at Washington and Colorado. And as things are implemented here in Oregon, try to look at mistakes that were done there and try to make it better. But it's going to happen. For many of you sitting in this room, this will really hit home because a whole bunch of cities around the state read the ballot measure, which says that only the state can tax marijuana once this thing is passed. And so a bunch of cities got in and said, guess what? We're going to pass rules saying that we're going to tax it at the city level before it's passed. And so all this will merrily go on its way to the court system, and we'll figure out if the cities can actually tax it or not. In voters' minds and people's minds in general, it's also going to get mixed up with the medical marijuana issue about dispensaries and those kinds of things. So there's a whole lot of unknowns that are still out there on pot, but we've, we've legalized it and, and off we go. Uh, one thing to pay particular attention to that no one's really talked about, right now legalized pot is basically okay because the Attorney General of the United States said it's basically okay even though it violates federal law. If we have a different president who brings in a different attorney general, there may be a different opinion on that. And so then we'll watch something collide in the US Supreme Court about the ability of states to do things like legalize pot in the face of federal rules that say it's illegal. So that's a, that's a, we're at the beginning of a conversation about that. Um, my personal favorite was Measure 90, the top two primary system. Top two primary system, kind of boring unless you're a policy wonk or like politics. And, and, you know, I do both. And so what the heck? It was great. I didn't have any idea what I was going to do voting on it. Um, the evidence of it, looking at California, which has had it for a few election cycles, and Washington, which has had a form of this for decades, is that this top two election, top two primary system does not bring in new voters. It doesn't give you surprising outcomes. It's, people don't win because of the system. It's exactly he would predict would win that uh, comes through the system. Uh, and so from that point of view, you know, what's the point? But on the other side, as someone who watches elections a lot, I'd love it when the election rules change and everybody's got to figure out what to do. Uh, vote by mail, for instance, was really great to watch and see how campaigns shifted around and did all that kind of stuff. So I was, I was torn um, about what I'd do. Then I got a mailing from the Democratic Party of Oregon that said in very clear words, you have to vote against this because billionaires are going to take over your polit political system. And I said to myself, well, that's a lie. And so I was swayed by that. I voted yes. Two days later, I got a mailer from the people who were in favor of Measure 90. And they said in very clear words, Boy, you got to vote for this, because if you don't, those political parties are going to have smoke-filled rooms, and they're going to determine who all your candidates are. This is Oregon. Give me a break. That's a lie, too. Uh, I'd already cast my ballot. Otherwise, I would have been undecided yet again, <laughs> uh, flipping <laughs> coins, I guess, to try to figure out what to do with it. Uh, the people of Oregon, once again, this is one of those things where you look at it, is there a reason to change? Uh, and the good people of Oregon looked at this and they said uh, um, 68 to 32% no, <laughs> go away, we don't want this. Here's why this happened. We've had a major change in how elections are run in this state. It's vote by mail. Remember where vote by mail came from. We did it first time for a big statewide race in the special election to replace Bob Packwood in 1996. By that fall, so that's in January, December of 95 and January of 96, 
by that fall in the regular election of 1996, over half the electorate in Oregon was doing de facto vote by mail because they asked for and got absentee ballots. The legislature looked at it and either Republicans or Democrats said, no, we don't want it because it'll favor the other side. They didn't do anything. So then signatures were gathered. It was put on the ballot in 1998. It was approved overwhelmingly. And why was it approved? Because it was what the people were already doing in terms of election reform. The top two system fix a problem that people don't see as a problem. And so until that, that realization comes about, until people say, wow, we have to change things, what we're getting in the general elections isn't working, then something like the top two primary system isn't gonna have a chance. Uh, here's an argument that I thought that the people in favor of the top two system would actually use. When you look at Oregon House seats around the state, about half of them had only one person on the ballot. It's not that there was one person and a libertarian or something, it was just that there was one person. And I thought that people would use that in the campaign to say, hey, look, about half the state is being denied a choice in the general election. Uh, they didn't do that. Uh, it didn't go anywhere. But those kinds of arguments have got to take off from the people up rather than from the people with the ideas down in terms of getting these kinds of things out there. Uh, there's other ballot measures. We can talk about them as, as we go on in case anybody wants to figure out if you know, any judges can go teach at a college now or any of that other kind of stuff. Uh, let's look at the Oregon legislature. The Oregon legislature was uh, fun. Uh, it was fun because there were a very limited number of seats in both legislatures, both the, the Senate and the House, that we were really focusing on. And the cool thing was most of them were right here in, in Washington County. Um, many of you know that I have a class where I require my students to go out and work in campaigns. Uh, this year, for the first time in forever, about 35% of the class is actually Republican. College students who are Republicans, it's like, oh my gosh, it's a miracle. Uh, so we had people on both sides of several campaigns, which was really nice. And we had people who were uh, looking, they were part of the Star and Riley race. And the paper that you have to turn in just before the election, the day before, you have to turn in a prediction paper. And it's fascinating reading them because whoever was on which campaign predicted their person was going to win, but they weren't sure it would really happen. And given the closeness of the race, where last I checked, Chuck Raleigh's up by about 250 votes, uh, given the closeness of the race, they were exactly right. No one knew what was going to happen. Um, so when we look at the Oregon Senate, in, in general, the Republicans come in behind 14 to 16 in the 30-seat body. Uh, they are aiming especially to defend a, a seat in the Corvallis area and also to flip a seat in the Ashland area. The one in the Ashland area held by Alan Bates, he had only won by 275 votes in the election four years ago. So the Republicans came back with the same guy. They were really going for that. Uh, in the, the Corvallis area, a Republican had been appointed, and so she had never defended that seat, and so the Republicans were going to spend a lot of money to keep that seat. The problem in that particular district is there are 6,500 more registered Democrats in the district than there are Republicans, and it's got Oregon State in it. And so if the students turn out, it's going to be the, the, the Democrats are going to win. And so we looked around, and, and, and there were some other races that were pretty fascinating. Uh, the Republicans decided to try to knock off Peter Courtney, the longest-serving member of the legislature and the president of the Senate. Uh, and so that was going to be a good, fun one. And then we were thinking there were some other ones that were up here. There were a couple in Clackamas County, but then there was the Bruce Starr uh, race with Chuck Riley here, where everybody thought that Starr was going to win, but... The registration in the district suggests that if you've got a good Democrat, that Democrat can win. Remember, if we look at Washington County, Washington County 20 years ago was Republicans, and now Washington County is Democrats when we look at the state legislative uh, uh, delegation. And so this, he was kind of this Republican island, and so are we going to get a good, strong candidate? And Chuck Riley's been in office before. He's got ups and downs in terms of his career. A strong candidate, I would not say, but a faithful Democratic candidate, absolutely. And so we were looking at those, the, the Ashland race and the Corvallis race and possibly the Peter Courtney race as kind of the center, and then these other ones might do something. And so we were looking and looking and looking, and boy, a lot of money was spent. 
Um, in the Ashland race, over a million dollars. In the Corvallis race, over a million dollars. Uh, Peter Courtney, it turns out, pretty much turned away his challenger about four weeks ago, so money stopped coming into that race. Um, so we were looking out there, and it actually looked like the Democrats were going to pick up that Corvallis seat. And then about three weeks before the election, all of a sudden, money started flowing to Chuck Riley. Obviously, internal polls had said, Riley's got a real chance to win this race. And boy, did money start flowing towards Chuck Riley. Uh, as of yesterday, the amount for both of them is $1.8 million. $904 million for Riley, $906 million, or $906 million, $906,000 for, for Star, and $904,000 for Riley. On election day, with the reporting, you know, there's a lag time of a few days in the reporting. At that point, uh, Star was $200,000 ahead of Riley. So all this money comes in right at the last minute. And it's basically aimed at get out the vote. Get out the vote, get out the vote, get out the vote. And by just a few hundred votes, it does. Um, it raises a real question, because when you look at this, there was a libertarian in this race. And the libertarian, people have noted off in a lot of other places, there are 300 registered libertarians in that particular district. And this particular libertarian ended up getting uh, several thousand votes. So gosh, what does this mean? Well, when you look at it, because it's that close and because of the history of libertarians in this state, it means the libertarian cost star the election. Because libertarians will break on social issues. So for instance, if, if pot was a huge issue, pot would bring in voters who would also vote for the libertarian candidate. So that'd be Democrats who'd be switching over. But in that particular district, that wasn't what Starr was running on. It wasn't what Riley was running on. We didn't see a huge turnout in Washington County because of pot. And I'll tell you why in just a bit. Uh, and so it was run on Starr's issues of smaller government, less regulation. And that's what libertarians love on the economic side. And so when we look at it, I don't think there's any doubt that the libertarian cost star that particular election. Uh, but it was really, 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 really close. Uh, another fascinating sidelight in that election, we have an independent party in Oregon. Independent party is an actual official party with a capital I. Uh, it's not clear if the independent party is a real party or not. It doesn't have a platform. It does have members. It has a primary that's online, and then you have to do stuff offline. And so it has 100,000 registered members, basically, <coughs> in the entire state. With their primaries, they get a turnout of approximately 1,100. So you can do the math. That's about a 1% turnout for the primary. In that particular Senate race, their primary, because they can, we now have a new state law, so you can jointly endorse, so people can go into an election and be the Democrat independent as well. In that particular uh, district, the independents split 50% to 50% exactly for Riley and Starr. Now, that's 23 votes to 23 votes, which is not very many votes. But the independent party um, may be playing a bigger role as it goes along, but it's got to solidify. It's got to have something that it means rather than just independent. Uh, it's fascinating to look at their website. Their, their, their platform is basically what they do on polling of those 1,100 people when they vote. And they say, our platform is 72% of us believe this and 54% of us believe this. And that's not a platform. That's an opinion poll. Uh, so we'll see what happens with that. But they, I don't think they played a role in this race. They tried to play a role in several other races. There, for instance, in the Central Valley was an independent who was in a race taking on a Republican. Um, and uh, he got mid 40%. He did not come close to winning, but the independent party is out there and beginning to breathe. Here's why it's important to us. They're about ready to pass the threshold of members so that they're considered a major party and they will actually have a real uh, uh, primary election in May. Um, last time we saw this was the, the party that came up around Ross Perot in 1992, which survived for a couple of election cycles as well. So the independent party is out there. So that, that was the Senate. In the House, um, you know, we were looking there, and the Democrats started out with a 34-26 majority. Um, looking around, there were some Democrats that we were saying, wow, they could lose. And the reason they could lose is they were in districts like How District 29 and 30 right here that in the past election cycles have gone during the midterms to the Republicans, during the presidential elections to the Democrats. 
back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So there's two here, there's two in Clackamas County, and then there were a couple of others in the rest of the state we were looking at, mainly because a longtime Republican had retired and the district had become more Democratic. And so if there was a party line vote, a Democrat ought to win in those particular districts as we were looking at them. And so lo and behold, on election night, the Democrats all held very well in the swing districts. And by very well, I mean none of this 250 vote difference kind of thing. They were winning like 54 to 46%. So it was very strong wins for the Democrats. And one of those districts that used to have a Republican in it, the Republican had left office, uh, and more Democrats were registered in there now, the incumbency effect was gone, and so a Democrat picked up one of those seats, and so the Democrats increased to 35 in the upcoming legislature. So a good time for Democrats, uh, not that great a time for Republicans. Uh, the legislature met this past week in their caucuses and decided who their leadership is going to be, and basically didn't change anything. That makes perfect sense for the Democrats. They did well. It's kind of odd for the Republicans because they didn't do that well, but there you go. Uh, and so all those kinds of fun things. A couple of uh, local things, and then we'll get to some questions. Uh, locally, remember, because we have nonpartisan elections for county commission and things like that, a lot of the good races were in May. Uh, but the big one we were really looking at here in Washington County was the, uh, the uh, car registration fee for the roads. What was going to happen to that? You may recall this started a year ago. The, the county commission said, geez, our roads are in trouble. How are we going to pay for it? Uh, and they thought that they could just pass it in the county commission and put it out there. And th they were right, but they then thought, oh, if we do that, people will do a referendum. And so it got put off, and it, we voted on it this time. It got beat. It got beat rather handily. Uh, it was fascinating to me because there basically wasn't a campaign about this thing at all. Um, if roads are the problem, and if this is the way we can come to, 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 to fix them and to pay for it, then you've got to run a campaign that says, hey, the reason that we want to add this here is because look at these bumpy roads. Anywhere. And that campaign never happened in any way, shape, or form. And so when you look around the state, in places you would expect, so Multnomah County, where the economy is going well, uh, they passed tax measures. In the suburbs, it was a mix, and in the areas away from the metro areas, they voted down tax measures. And as the story in the Oregonian today does very well, it's because the economy is not working in those areas away from the metro areas. It's a wash or getting better in some of the metro area suburbs, and it's getting better in the central parts of the, or of the, the metropolitan areas. And so people looked at taxes and did as they usually do. Can I afford this tax? What does it mean to me? The Washington County tax went down, I would argue, because there really wasn't a campaign to explain what the heck it was. All we had is a voter pamphlet statement. And uh, so there we go. Um, uh, some fun things. There are some really good close races around the state. Uh, there's in the Forest Grove. You're going to have Pete Truax here. Uh, Pete Truax, who's uh, been around in the Forest Grove City Council and mayor for a long time. Somebody took him on just because they didn't think Pete should be able to walk through, and that someone almost beat Pete. Uh, and so there's those kinds of things kind of hiding out around there. But basically, in Oregon, it was a good night for Democrats. It was a, and one of the few places in the country where that happened. A good night for Democrats. It was about what we expect for uh, ballot measures. About a third of them pass. And when you look at how it's going to finally turn out, that's going to be about where we are in terms of the ballot measures themselves. And then you look at the Oregon legislature, it, it moves on with a Democratic majority that increases. Uh, just one last thing, what does this mean for 2015? I don't think one heck of a lot. The legislature is a legislature that responds to what the governor brings to it. It's not a legislature that generates huge ideas on its own. So what's the legislature going to do? Number one, all those bills that failed because Betsy Johnson voted against them in the Oregon Senate are going to be resubmitted. How do we know that's going to happen? Because Michael Bloomberg, who has a huge interest in gun safety, and a guy named Tom Steyer, who has a huge interest in climate change, gave money to the Democratic candidates, Chuck Riley, and to the, the uh, one who beat the Republican in the Corvallis area. And so, by gosh, those votes are going to come up. And the Republicans are going to say, oh, that's a bad idea. And Betsy Johnson might say it's a bad idea. But the Democrats have built up their majority, and so they'll go right around her. 
But beyond that, we're waiting. Remember, Kitzhopper said he had a huge tax measure for us, a, a tax reform idea. Well, we haven't heard boo about it, and the word is that uh, since it won't involve any sales tax, that we can't have a big tax reform idea. Uh, and so I don't think this is going to be a legislature that's going to go down in history as the one that changed the course of human history. Uh, and that's a good thing and a bad thing, but, but that's just kind of the way things are at this point. So why don't we stop there and get questions from you guys. Uh, Tom Lee, forum member. Um, I have a question about ballot measure 88. That's the one involving uh, driver's licenses for undocumented aliens. Um, that uh, ballot measure failed by a wide margin, 66% uh, to 34%. That's uh, like a two to one uh, rejection of uh, the ballot measure. And um, I am, uh, I, I think uh, it would seem uh, just from doing the numbers that uh, uh, since the Democrats uh, prevailed so solidly uh, throughout uh, Oregon, uh, except for over in the, uh, the across the mountains, uh, it would seem to me that not only conservative uh, people, but also some very liberal people were voting against uh, this ballot measure. And I guess I've dev developed a, a a couple theories about it. One uh, theory is uh, the, the, the public's perception that our borders, our national borders, have dissolved, and uh, that uh, and, and that uh, and that includes not only the, the 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 southern border, but also the border that happens at every international airport in the country, and that uh, if if uh, this uh, trend uh, were to continue, uh, the, 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 the country and its culture are going to be swamped by uh, the, the uh, ensuing... I, I, think I, can jump, I yes. think I can jump in here with your so, theories here. Yeah, so, so I, I'd like to know if you have uh, a different explanation for this uh, that, that involves I, the liberals who voted for it. Uh, yes, I absolutely it. do. Uh, this race was fascinating because it was beaten two to one. The only county where it passed was Multnomah County, where it passed about 55-45. I had a student who was in this campaign. And so her job was to basically go to Cornelius and speak Spanish to people. And there it was great. Everybody she talked to was in favor of this. In fact, a lot of them didn't know about it. They were going to vote for the first time because of this. Perfect. Then they took her to North Portland to knock on doors. And guess what? It was going to pass there, too. And so this is what I'm teaching my students. You must look at the district as a whole. There are opinion polls that say this is going to get hammered. And so she predicted it would win, because when you're in a campaign, you predict it's going to win. Uh, but she knows why it didn't. So here's what happened. This is a race that I thought was going to create an, a very interesting conversation in this state. When you go and talk to Republicans in suburban areas, Republicans in suburban areas look at immigration, and they say everything you said in theory won. Okay, our borders, our borders are porous. There's all these things that come in. It's, it's awful. If you go into the agricultural Republicans, the agricultural Republicans look at immigration and they say, that's our workforce, that's why you have peas on your table, hops in your beer, and Christmas trees. And so I thought this is going to be an amazing conversation outside of the Portland area about between those two groups. So here's what happened. When you look at places like Klamath County, Lake County, Umatilla County, all those places, the people in favor of this measure were in the teens, like 17% in favor, 83% against. Anecdotally, talking to people in the ag community in those places, they said, this is such a charged issue because of theory one. It's such a charged issue right now, we couldn't have those conversations. And so generally across the state, this was beaten two to one, including in Washington County. Uh, the, the, it was basically came up at the wrong time because nationally immigration is the third rail of politics right now. 
If this had happened 15 years ago, it probably would have been different. If it's 15 years from now, it might be different. But right now, put this before the people, it's going to lose. And it's going to lose because of the suburban voters. And remember, Oregon is not a rural, urban state. The entire West is the most urbanized part of the country. We live in towns. We live in, in effect, suburbs. The farmers, the people who live outside, are few and far between in this state compared to driving across Iowa or Ohio, where there's a farm every mile. You don't have that in Oregon. And so this got caught up in that national trend, and that's why it got beat. Just that simple. So. Bill Kroger, forum member. Thanks for coming in today. Uh, your presentations are always good, and they're, you're welcome, so thanks. Uh, you talked a little bit about voting. I was just curious, in Oregon, I think the voting was around 60, 65 percent of the total, but nationwide it was like 35 percent. So I was wondering if you'd just talk about that difference. Sure. Um, remember, in Oregon, we brag about our voting turnout, but we also lie about it. Uh, and here's why we lie. We have the highest number of registered voters who turn out, but we have one of the lowest percentages of registered voters among the voting age population in the country. So if you look at it in terms of registered voters, we're going to be at 70 percentage or so, uh, and we'll be at the top of the list. But if you look at it in terms of voting age population, which the rest of the country uses, uh, we're about fourth. We're going to be at about 52 percent. Um, and so when you look at that, either way, we did pretty well. And I think it's two things. I think it's the culture. There's a culture in Oregon where people actually do turn out to vote. Uh, but secondly, we did, even though they didn't generate as much enthusiasm as we thought, we got these ballot measures going. The pot measure, the GMO measure, drive a lot of things. A little bit of evidence of that, uh, the pot measure, people were saying, gosh, this is going to bring in young voters. And we don't know if it did or not because you can't add an age to a specific vote. However, where did this thing pass with a really high percentage? Multnomah County, you'd expect that. Benton County, home of Oregon State, 70% yes. Lane County, home of U of O, 70% yes. I think that's pretty good anecdotal evidence that the young people were voting. As of last week, a little bit of evidence coming out of the Secretary of State's office, no final numbers on it. But remember, there's a dip in these midterm elections. If you're over age 40, that dip was at least a 4% dip this time from the presidential election. For people under the age of 30, the dip was 1%. So proportionally, the younger people were voting at a higher rate than they, they usually do. And that, I think, gets us to that, to that higher number. So. If that's the case, we're in real trouble. Is that right? <laughs> no, Harry Bodine, forum member. If uh, the independent party is about to get the majority party status, and they came to you as a consultant and say, what should we do with this? new authority that we have, new, new, under the law. Well, remember, um, I say enough things about them in the press that they actually usually send me really long emails or yell at me on the phone. So what would I suggest? A, you need a platform. What does it mean to be independent? B, you need to then work on getting people elected. They keep trying for state offices and getting on there. They need to get some county commissioners elected. They need to get some city councilors elected. They need to do all those kinds of things, unless they can get some kind of a superstar to come out and say, I'm an independent. OK, so this might be the Chris Dudley factor if we were to look at that kind of thing. Um, I'm not sure that in Oregon you're going to find that kind of superstar independent person. It's not our culture. Very different from Vermont, from Maine, from Connecticut, where independents run, want, uh, run and win Senate seats, governor seats, those kinds of things. We just don't have that culture. But they've got to work from the ground up. They've got to work from the ground up. And um, they need to, as they get their status, they can't be like the Ross Perot party, which lasted two election cycles. You've got to have turnout in those primaries that equals the turnout of the two regular parties. And then those candidates have got to go through and start making a difference in terms of actually winning <coughs> elections. So platform first, candidates second, winning third. Hi, Anthony Mills, uh, forum member. In the Republican primary, Monica Webby was challenged by Jason Conger, Correct. who seemed to have a much, much more impressive resume than her and, and was in the legislature, but she won. Could you give your opinion on why that was? Sure. Uh, Jason Conger, um, the main thing he brought to that race, once again, he didn't bring any of his governing in the, in the House to the race. He brought his social conservatism to the race. And 
Republicans are not silly in this state. They know that if you're going to win statewide office, you've got to have a moderate Republican because you've got to bring in those unaffiliated voters and maybe take in some of the Democrats as well. And you just have to look at Chris Dudley for that. Okay, and so there was some strategic voting going on, and the Republicans chose Monica Webby over the social conservative. Here's where Monica Webby went wrong. Monica Webby patterns basically said, and this was what was attractive to her at the national level, attractive about her. She said, I'm a moderate. I'm a pro-choice kind of Republican who believes in gay rights. Okay, wow. You know, social issues right there, that's great. And yet in her campaign, not word one about either of those things. In fact, once things started happening in September with the Koch brothers running ads against Merkley, not for her, but against Merkley, the Merkley people were very, very easily able to say, Monica Webby, press her and you get Karl Rove. <laughs> and her answers were Karl Rove answers. And this, I mean, the, the biggest thing to me about Monica Webby's campaign, she's a first-time candidate, you know, all those kinds of things. But the, the thing is, I think she had incompetent campaign management. Absolutely. The people she fired, who then went on to run the Richardson campaign uh, from the May primary, and then the people that she brought in for the general election, you see with those big, big empty spaces when things happen and nothing, would, there would be no response. But you also see it when she was given questions that she should have been very easily to turn and say, wow, economically I'm here, but here's how that plays out for Oregonians, rather than say this and you sound exactly like a DC Republican uh, that doesn't play here at all. So I think she had very poor management. Mark Freiberg, forum member. Do you have any idea what role the female vote played in the Star Riley race. I say that because I saw a slew of anti-star attack ads that seem to be going for what you might consider female hot button issues. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we don't know because uh, this isn't something that we ask. We don't have exit polls and we don't, this isn't something that's on the voter uh, registration. But the sense is that women turned out in big numbers. And this is, we see this because not only here, but we look at the swing districts. The swing districts went back and forth partly because there were fewer women that voted in them during the off-year elections and more women during the general elections or the, the, the presidential elections. So the, the outcome would suggest that women were swayed by this. But remember, any of this negative campaigning is, is very, very, very effective, but you have to have a couple of conditions. You have to do it late in the game because you can't change anybody's mind either to not vote or convert them until they've made up their mind first. They have to have chosen somebody, and then you try to knock them off of that. So we see that. Uh, and, and the second thing with negative campaigning is it's always going to blow back up in your face. But you want that blow up to happen after election day. <laughs> and so we saw that. On, on the Republican side, and fascinating, if you, if you want some good reading, go look at the, the Secretary of State's or star pages on the money in these giant races. There was a whole bunch of in-kind money that came to Republicans and Democrats. And so that's, that's advertising from affiliated groups, all these kinds of things. Here's how I knew this race was close. There's an ad that started in that Corvallis, or that Peter Courtney race first, that was a, a Willie Horton ad. It accused Peter Courtney of voting to let rapists and murderers get out and go and commit crimes within hours of getting out of prison. It didn't work there. So they ran that in the Corvallis race. It didn't work there. Here's how I knew that it was almost curtains for, for uh, uh, Star. It started running about six days before election day in the district up here, which is the sign of a desperation, I think. And so we don't know the women, but the suspicion is looking at the other things that women turned out in a higher percentage than they usually do. Uh, Phil Nelson, forum member. I have a question about the college financing measure. Mm -hmm. Uh, would you have some comment on uh, what that means in terms of public attitudes in regard to education and uh, yeah. how we're going? So the, the public financing measure goes down 43% to 57%. Uh, remember, this is basically to use uh, um, through the power of the treasurer to put money away, and it's eventually going to be something you can borrow against and all those other kinds of wonderful things. Here's why it failed. Um, number one, there was really no campaign to explain what the heck it was. And when you look at the ballot in, the, in the, the voters' pamphlet, it was not exactly clear there either. Two, for those who were explaining, Ted Wheeler, who pushed this thing, wanted this thing, came out and said a wonderful thing. He said, well, you know, actually, for the first five to 10 years, it's not going to be able to do much. 
Because, you know, it's not going to raise that much money at the beginning. And it's, it's like, you know, give us something to work with there. So it was treated basically like another money measure at a statewide level, and people voted it down. So. Well, this can, this can, uh, ends the television uh, portion of the program. Um, we're going to have more questions, of course. And I would just thank Professor Moore. Um, for years, uh, for at least the first two or three weeks after his presentation, I was able to be smarter than most people around here. Um, and then my son went to college, and he keeps saying, did you know, he keeps trumping me whenever he comes home. So uh, you all have the benefit again. So brag and fail to attribute where you got the information, as I did for a long time. Again, we're on, chapter 20, we're on channel 27 of the Walton Valley um, TVCC network. Please tune in, turn on, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. So now you can ask the good questions because the TV's off. Yeah, it was going to be short. <laughs> uh, what effect did the Equal Rights Amendment that was on the ballot have yeah. and the women's vote turnout? You know, the, the, what effect did that, that have? It's hard to say it had any effect because there was no campaign one way or the other on the thing. Um, and remember, the Equal Rights Amendment was just fascinating. The ACLU came out against it. It's like, oh, well, that makes perfect sense. Uh, their reasoning was that these, these protections are already built into the Constitution and you don't want to, in effect create new little things that every other group's going to say we want this specific clause in there. Uh, the people of Oregon looked at a non-campaign, looked at this and said, you know, an equal rights amendment's a good thing. And so we've got it. What's it going to mean? We have no idea until somebody uses it to challenge a pay disparity, to p challenge a paternal leave, you know, whatever it is, uh, we'll, we'll see what it actually means. Um, but I'm not I don't think it had any effect on women's turnout just because there was no campaign. John Williams, a board member, and uh, I thank you so much for being here because you're so full of good information, so thank you. Um, my question is, uh, deals with the independent party, and that uh, a lot of people that I talk to, uh, I'm an independent. I think independent. But you ask them, are you registered? No. Uh, but they, they classify themselves as independents, and so I'm wondering how many people are in that 100,000 people are are signed up, but they're really independent thinking, and, and rather than being a member of the independent party, the non-affiliated is what I'm really So here's So here's my hypothesis that gets them to yell at me, and then I'll give you their hypothesis. My hypothesis is exactly that, that people who sign up to be in the independent party don't know that they've signed up for a party. And the way you can tell that is you can look at the other parties. I mean, you can't say libertarians don't have a platform or the Green Party doesn't have a platform. They've got platforms, they've got ideas, they've got candidates, and they all end up with 15,000, 20,000, maybe 30,000 people registered in their parties. Independent Party, remember, it's there because of a change in state law, and they, they basically said, oh, we're going to do the Independent Party, People in Oregon before that, and nationally, when you hear people talk about unaffiliated voters, they talk about independents. And so when you look at them, I think the independents, are, most of them are going to be you know, something above that $20,000, $30,000 threshold. The other 80,000, 70,000 of them are going to be people who are unaffiliated. That's what I think. So here's their response. Their response is, we've now been around for a couple of election cycles. Uh, we don't think voters are that stupid. Uh, and when you look at it, um, we're actually making a difference because in 2012, candidates we endorsed won. Okay? Here's my counter argument to that. This time, the primary that they had, that online thing, endorsed a lot of Republicans and they all lost in contested races. And so I don't think the, the independent party makes a difference one way or the other. Uh, but when they get major party status, they're going to have to actually, you know, put the pedal to the metal and make something happen. Yeah, John Bell, a former member. I'm still concerned about driver's licenses. Mm -hmm. um, we have these 100,000 plus or 200 in Oregon that can't get a new driver's license because they're not they're undocumented, and that they're driving in our streets or they can't get insurance without driver's licenses, and they have businesses. They need, I have do income taxes, and mm -hmm. I have several that have small businesses. The only way they're going to get a driver's license is go over to Washington pay somebody to have a re receipt so they can say that they're now resident of Washington and they get a driver's license from Washington. And so it's, you know, that's a real problem. It's not going to stop people from coming into the United States. The easiest way to come to the United States today, you get a visitor pass, a visa, come and stay. Mm -hmm. And that's where the, a lot of property people from other countries are coming in, they're staying. 
we all, we all think they're from the, coming from Mexico and southern South, South America, but uh, there are actually more or as many coming in and staying as they come across the borders. Yeah, no, the, the, this is a classic thing where the politics say resoundingly one thing, but the reality on the ground says something else. And immigration is like that. In the United States, this took off um, 2002, 2004 election. You, you get a sense, somebody in the White House and the Bush administration said, we gotta bring up immigration, it's gonna move voters. Because it wasn't an issue in a huge way before then, then it took off. So here's the reality of it. When you look at the size of economies around the world, the amount of immigration that we have, legal and illegal, is exactly what you predict given the size of the economies that are around us. You have the same rate of immigration between Europe, the European Union, and the poorer countries next to it. There's about a six to one ratio of income per capita, and the immigration rates are exactly the same coming in. And so if people are really worried about immigration in this country, the putting the lines up is not gonna help. It never has. What you gotta do is you've either gotta bring our income per capita down, ooh, that'll be popular, or bring the income per capita up of our neighbors and immigration will cease to be an issue. But until then, this is, this is, it's a band-aid, but the politics of it say that we're an anti-immigrant country right now. We've gone through this many, many times in our history and we're in the middle of one right now. Yeah. John Hutzler, forum member. Um, obviously, with this election behind us, it's uh, time to start thinking about 2016. Um, I saw, <laughs> I saw a, a comment by a Republican commentator, actually, that um, described uh, this most recent election on a national basis as a disaster for Republicans, um, that Republicans have uh, solidified their hold on states which represent a minority of the Electoral College. Mm -hmm. Um, but have not really made inroads in the large states that, that um, determine the election. Um, and that um, the, um, uh, the, the mood of the country is evidenced by votes on ballot measures around the country and, and uh, issues uh, suggests that the country is, is that, that voters are, are, um, are more sympathetic to democratic positions than Republican positions, even if they elected Republican candidates. What's your opinion of what, what, what the implications of this election are for right. 2016 presidential? Well, here, here's, here's the thing that Democrats are looking at and smiling at with glee. Uh, states that voted for Republican senators passed mandatory higher minimum wages. And so Republicans look at that and say, ooh, issues, we got them. Here's what Republicans, or Democrats say, we got them. Republicans look at that and say, yeah, but we got the Senate. Um, so here, here's the deal. Um, it's good that the Republicans won for the Republicans, but going from here to an election two years from now is a huge leap. Once again, put yourself in 1994. Newt Gingrich has swept in on the contract with America. We've got the biggest gains we've seen in decades for Republicans. The Republicans control both houses of Congress, and people were basically saying, geez, you know, where's Bill Clinton gonna retire? And I kept saying, the Republicans have gotta come up with a candidate. And they did, and that candidate had the misfortune of being Bob Dole, who's a great campaigner, but here's one thing that people haven't really thought about. We had just celebrated in 1995 the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II. And he was running as a World War II veteran. And doing the math, a lot of people looked and said, that's, that's too removed. And so the, the, the Republicans have got to come up with candidates. And right now, there is none. Uh, the, the flavor of the moment tends to be kind of whatever the flavor of the moment is. And it'll change. Uh, here's something to remember, especially when you look on the Democratic side at Hillary. At this point, in the run-up to the 2008 election, so it's 2006, Hillary Clinton was the odds-on winner of the Democratic nomination and a good chance to be the first female president of the United States. And all those other people who they were thinking of running, Barack Obama's name wasn't even on the list. So it's a long, long ways out. Here's the big thing for Republicans. They now control both houses of Congress. They can't just pass things and then have them vetoed by the president. They've got to govern. 
And so Republicans have been talking very openly. We can't shut down the government again because there's nobody to blame it on except ourselves this time. And so we'll see what they do. Um, looking at the past two Congresses, I don't have any great hopes that this Congress is going to pass anything meaningful anyway. What did we see in the lame duck Congress last week? They came back and the House immediately began to pass repealing Obamacare again. Um, just because, you know, they didn't get it right the first time or first 47 times. So it, it's, it's going to be tough for Republicans um, right now. A little different. Uh, with the problems in Mexico, how can you say North America is the place to be when you have these problems? And that would affect the driver uh, card. In terms of the murders and things like that going on down there, or economics, or everything? Everything. Everything. Well, remember, there is another immigration issue. Many, many people from Central America are going to Mexico. We talk about them passing through to here, but a whole bunch of them do not pass through here. Mexico, because of NAFTA, Mexico's economy has taken off. There have been huge parts of the economy that are wiped out because of NAFTA, because NAFTA all of a sudden makes it so that it doesn't make sense to grow corn in Mexico. It makes sense to grow it in Iowa and then process it and get the tortillas down to Mexico. So it, it wiped out agricultural communities, but the economy as a whole has taken off in Mexico. So Mexico has the same issue with its neighbors to the south and in the Caribbean as we do with Mexico and being a pass-through. So it's, 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 when you look at it in terms of economics, it's really, really clear. It's the proportional sizes of the economies. Thank you. And I wouldn't go to Acapulco on vacation right now. <laughs> Lee Coleman, forum member. I've got a theoretical question for you. How would you force uh, separation between the Tea Party and the Republican Party? <laughs> Uh, I think that separation is happening, and the reason it's happening is because in 2010 and 2012, Tea Party candidates were basically defeated at the polls in the general election. A few of them got through, but not many. Uh, and so that separation is happening. The Republicans worked very, very hard not to let Tea Party candidates through. I think um, uh, Greg Walden had a Tea Party opponent that he just creamed in his uh, congressional primary. Uh, there's some evidence that Art Robinson could be Tea Party-ish, and Art Robinson is just going backwards. Um, there were some Tea Party candidates that did get into the Oregon legislature, um, hard-fought primaries, and now they're in. So this is where we're going to watch what happens to the Republican caucus in the legislature with those Tea Party people, people like Bill Post, for instance, a guy named McNearman. Um, on, you know, what, what happens to the caucus? Does it go to those guys? Remember, they, they're not going to win any votes, so do they have to cater to them or not? And that, that's where we're gonna really watch. But the divorce is happening. The divorce is happening right now. Actually, I was gonna ask a question, but it was so abstruse that I decided not to. So I'll just from announce from here, thank you, Professor Moore, and um, thank you everyone. Don't forget to tip your um, servers, and thank you for coming. And uh, this is probably my last moment as president, um, so I'll cherish it. Thank you. Hey, John. <laughs>